but I must at long last reveal to you. I got it on record after record that Ma Sell that better owned the greatest coon dog that ever lived. Highball. I told you about how he fought the raccoon on the railroad track. Oh, I told you how he was running across. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, just barking at a coon, and all of a sudden he stopped. And he said, Uncle Bursa, what's the matter? He said, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute. About 30 seconds, Highball started barking again. Oh, 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 oh. Well, Uncle Bursa said, just as I thought, he was running across posted land. I told you about that on a record about 15 years ago. But what I've never told you, I saw with my own eyes Highball running a big boa coon. The coon dived in the river. Marcel dived in the river right after the raccoon. They both underwater. After a little bit, Highball come up, stuck his head up out of the water, and he was smelling mud on his paw to see if the coon was walking on the bottom or swimming. <laughs> Woo! Oh, I love y'all. Just last week, I was asked to do some counseling. I've never done much of this, but words out, me and mama's been married since 1947 and happily married. And folks gets my advice that squabbling and thinking about getting a divorce. Ma Sal Edbetter heard that I was counseling and he decided he'd counsel his wife. <laughs> he set her down. And said, Asley, there's two things about you that gall me. <laughs> and we need to just get out in the open. We need to get it out in the open right now. Let me tell you what they are. And both of us can be a lot happier. She said, Marcel, the two things you fixed to tell me that's wrong with me is why I ain't got a better husband. <laughs> My dear friend called me the other day and said, Jerry, oh, I wish you could talk to my boy. His wife acts like she wants a divorce. My boy's wife says she wants to get a divorce, and that's awful. I said, look, your son is one of the nicest, most wonderful young men I've ever known in my life. What in the world is going on? He said, Jerry, I don't know, but I've asked the judge to let you sit in Friday morning when they have the preliminary hearing. And maybe you can pick up something that you can use to go counsel with them to get them back together. Well, I attended the meeting and sat back out of the way where I wouldn't interfere with nothing. The judge asked the young lady, said, young lady, why do you want to divorce this young man? She said, well, judge, we've been married six months and he ain't been in my bedroom. Just refuses to come in there. Sleeps down the hall. Well, the judge was shocked. I was shocked. <laughs> he looked at the young man and said, young man, why don't you sleep with your wife? He said, well, judge, about a month before we married, I was just making a sentence and used the word sex in the sentence. And she threw a fit, slapped me, knocked me down backwards. My head hit the ground. I had a slight concussion. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I've been scared to bring it up ever since. <laughs> My pastor went to a convention up in Chicago. He was invited by the Presbyterians. This was an ecumenical movement to try to get everybody together and go to loving one another. My pastor was on the program. They didn't put no name tags on nobody. 
Everybody on the program put one of them Presbyterian robes on. New venture for my preacher. But they'd make their little conference talk at one church, then load up in the cars and then go to another church. Well, they got through at this church and preacher got in his car and his wife sitting by him, had his robe on. He's going down Michigan Avenue and a policeman on a motorcycle blowing a serene stopped him. Yeah! Pulled him over. Big Irish cop. Walked up and my preacher spooled the window down. And the cop looked down at him and said, Oh, Father, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was you. You are about God's business, I'm sure. You go ahead, but slow the car down. And my preacher said, God bless you, my son. <laughs> Spooled the window up and took off. And his wife said, that's the most deceitful thing I've ever seen a Christian man do. How deceitful. You had that policeman thinking that you was a Catholic priest. My preacher said, you better be worried about who he thought you was. <laughs> I got an uncle that's the tightest man in the United States of America. He's tighter than the bark on a tree. His favorite yell at the high school football game is get that quarter back. <laughs> he got feeling bad the other day and got to hunting a bargain with a doctor. He don't know how cocoa tastes. My old tight uncle's never drank a Coca-Cola. He's so cheap. Well, he went to the medical arts building and he started walking up and down the hall trying to find the cheapest physician in the building. Directly, he come to a sign. It said $30 first visit, $15 repeat visit. My uncle come busting in the office and said, well, I'm here again. <laughs> Here I am one more time. <laughs> Doctor examined him hurriedly and said, Sir, you have exactly what you had the last time you was him. <laughs> Just use the same prescription that I gave you then. <laughs> and give the nurse $15 on your way out. <laughs> Marcel Ledbetter, when he had his last child, something happened the night before that child was born that set Amit County, Mississippi on fire. Marcel's wife was much with child. She said, you know, I better dust around the nightstands here and get the dust off of the bedstead because any minute Marcel's gonna have to rush me to the hospital. So one evening after supper, she dusted everything and put the stuff back on the nightstand. In the night, she heard a racket and thought the bed was moving. She woke up and Marcel wasn't in the bed. She went back to sleep, woke up in a little bit and he still wasn't in the bed. She eased up, tiptoed down the hall, pushed the door open gently to the bathroom and I sent Marcel in that squalling. Tears coming down his cheeks. She said, Marcel, what in the world is the matter? He said, when you done your dusting, you put the Ben Gay tube 
where the preparation H used to be. And what makes this so bad? I'm suffering, I'm dying, and there ain't nothing I can do about it. As a Catholic girl in Amit County, Mississippi, that fell in love with a deep water Baptist boy, the mother of the Catholic girl said, darling, this ain't going to work. Y'all going to be miserable. He's a hard-headed Southern Baptist. You was raised as a Catholic. I just hate to see y'all start off on the wrong foot. And the young lady asked her mother, said, well, mother, what do you think I ought to do? She said, you ought to convert him to Catholicism. And it won't ever be another time that's any better than right now for you to make the sale. So she left the house to go off to look her boyfriend in the eye and convert him to Catholicism. She come back in about three hours, squalling and crying and wringing her hands. And her mama said, honey, what's the matter? You didn't convert him? She said, yes, I did. He wants to be a Catholic, but I oversold him. He's decided to be a priest. <laughs> the older I get, the more difficult it is for me to hear. Looks like I'm going to have to get a hearing aid. I remember there was a man in my church who was stone deaf when I was a little boy. But he come to church every Sunday, Uncle Tom. Last four years of his life, he couldn't hear. One day, a man took a church bulletin and took a pencil and wrote him a note. He said, if you can't hear nothing, why do you come to church? And he took the pencil and said, I just want people to know what side I'm on. <laughs> there was another man in the church when I was a little boy that had a big old horn off of a cow. One of them like you blow when you're going coon hunting. Oh, look for him, and you blow out horn. Well, this old man put the little end of that horn in his ear and stuck the big end toward you if you was talking to him. One morning before church started, this old man went up to the pastor, and he said, I got a brindle colored cow, muley-headed, and she's missing. I'd like for you to make an announcement that she's missing, and I'd appreciate folks trying to help me find her. Well, church started and the preacher was up making the announcements. That old man had that horn listening. And the preacher was making an announcement about a lady who had been sick and the church had been missing her. Well, when that old man threw that horn heard missing, he yelled, and she's got a split in her left front tent, too. <laughs> I got a friend in Amit County that had a sore neck. And he went to the doctor, and a big burly nurse come walking out, hovered over him. She looked like something that Geo made when Chevrolet wasn't watching. <laughs> and my friend said, I got a sore neck. The nurse grabbed him by the elbow and said, come with me, and took him in there and put him in the corner of one of them snatching rooms and said, strip off. He said, I just got a sore neck. She said, pull off where the doctor can examine you. Get naked and give me your clothes and hush. <laughs> well, the old boy was sitting there on that cold stool, <laughs> holding his neck, 
and he saw another old boy sitting on the stool on the other side, naked. And he started complaining to him. He said, this is awful. I come in here, I got a sore neck. They made me strip off, and this old boy over here said, listen, you think you got problems? All I done was come here to deliver a package. <laughs> Hater Ledbetter is a high school football coach. He's good at it. He was in a crucial game, and he needed to talk to his starting quarterback what was in the game. His second-string quarterback and punter was sitting on the bench, and he called him over. He said, come here, son. I've got to talk to the quarterback. We fixed the call timeout. I want to send you in there, and you specifically listen to what I'm telling you now. You hand the ball off and run it to the right. You hand the ball off and run it to the left. You hand the ball off and run it straight up the middle. And then the fourth time, you back up and punt it just as far as you can kick it. You understand? Yes, sir. I understand. All right, go in. Coach Ledbetter was talking to that starting quarterback on the bench. And this second teamer handed the ball off to the right, and the fella broke it. The fella broke it off right tackle for 30 yards and knocked him out of bounds on the 50-yard line. Handed it off to the left, and he broke it down to the 20. Give it to the fullback up the middle, and he run to the five. Then the young man backed up and punted it over the goal post and over the stands and out into the parking lot. <laughs> a certified public accountant called a church in Amit County, Mississippi and said, I'm working on new Gene Ledbetter's tax return. Did he give this church $984.63 last year. And this voice said, I'm just the receptionist. I just answer the phone. The financial records are in another building. But Mr. CPA, if he didn't, he will. <laughs> W.L. Ledbetter had a drinking problem. I've worked with him, paid for him to go off to them killer cure places. Last five years, he's been pure, thank the Lord. But just before he decided to go for treatment, he went on one big toot. Come down through Liberty, Mississippi and run a red light. City police took to him. Got to the city limits, the highway patrol took to him. They had a chase for about 30 minutes all over the county. W.L. tried to make a turn, lost control of his car, went down a levee and into Amit River. He went down this levee and plunged into Amit River, and he got out and commenced walking, staggering, crawling up the levee and got up after the highway patrolman, and the highway patrolman said, W.L., are you drunk? He said, heck yes, I'm drunk. You don't think I'm one of them reckless drivers, do you? <laughs> At one of the schools in Abbott County, Mississippi, they had a promotion. They brought in a photographer, and they took a group picture of the class. They got the pictures back, and the teacher was motivating the children to go out and sell these pictures to where they could buy some more library books. The teacher said, children, go out and sell these pictures. We can make a profit. And let me tell you how you can sell them. You can say, look at that. Years from now, you can be sitting with your grandchildren. And you can say, look at that, that's Joe. He's a famous lawyer. Look at that, that's Bobby. He's a famous farmer. 
And a little girl spoke up and said, yeah, and you can say, look at that. That's teacher and she's dead. <laughs> you know, folks asked me about Ma Cell Ledbetter. And Associated Press calls me every now and then and wants to know what Ma Cell thinks about things. The other day, Ma Cell told me that he had the seven years itch, but he scratched out of it in a year and a half. <laughs> and he said it sure did surprise him that he'd never seen no blind people in them nudist colonies. <laughs> said, come to think of it, he ain't never seen no one-eyed people in them nudist colonies. <laughs> Lucius Ledbetter. That's Marcel's nephew. Ooh. Lucius took one of them Votec courses up at Southwest Mississippi Community College on how to fix appliances, how to be a service man. He finished with highest honors. Bought him a secondhand white van. Wrote on the side of that van, Lucius Ledbetter service company and put his telephone number. A lady called one morning, said, my dryer ain't working. I wonder if you can come and fix it. Lucius said, yes, ma'am, I can get to it this afternoon. Lady said, come around to the back to the utility room. The door will be open. She hung up the telephone and she thought, you know, there's a hamper of dirty clothes down there. I believe I'll go down and put them in the washer, wash the dirty clothes so when Mr. Ledbetter gets my dryer fixed, I can just transfer them into the dryer. She went out and dumped a hamper of clothes in the washer. She looked down and saw her chenille robe that she was wearing and was filthy. She just slipped it off, decided she'd wash it while she was standing there stuck it in the washer, and she's standing there buck naked. <laughs> she hears a racket at the door. She looks. Lucius Ledbetter is early. <laughs> the only way she can get out of there is by the door. He's walking in. She looks for something to wear. Oh, she panics. She trembles. And all she can find is her little boy's football helmet <laughs> on a shelf right up on top of the washing machine. She puts that on and buckles the strap good <laughs> and just stands there. Lucius comes walking by with his little toolbox. Dryer didn't need nothing but a few. Fixed it, walked back by, started up the steps, and he turned around and said, Lady, I sure do hope your team wins. <laughs> Last year, I was asked to speak at a high school commencement, and I went. I love being around young people. And I did the best I could. I didn't entertain. I got up and tried to be serious. After all, this is serious business. Young people finishing high school and going out into this world that some of us have made a mess of. I done the best I could. And when I got done, a lady come walking down front and had a little boy by the hand. And the lady looked at me and said, oh, Mr. Clower, I'm filled with your message. 
Oh, yeah, she was emotional. She said, oh, Mr. Clower, I'm filled with your message. And I looked at the little boy. I said, young man, what would you think about it? He said, I got a belly full of it, too. <laughs> Everywhere I go, folks say, Jerry, is Marcel Ledbetter real? Oh, folks, that's my dearest friend. I grew up with Marcel Ledbetter. A friend sticketh closer than a brother. I've known Marcel Ledbetter all my life. He is a good one. I used to go over there to his house. They was as poor as me and my mama and my brother Sonny were growing up. I was over there one time due to depression and ain't pet. Marcel's mama looked into the flower barrel and said, we don't have much flour left and it's beginning to mold. We've got to use it up. We can't afford to let any of it ruin. She said the best way to use it up is make it up into flour gravy and can it. Now, some people call it milk gravy. Some people call it sawmill gravy. It's most widely called sawmill gravy all over the world. She made up that gravy, put a little grease in there, got it hot, sprinkled a little flour in there, stirred that flour good up and made a thickening then poured a, about half milk and half water and then stirred it till it got thick. And then she canned it. But every seventh quart, I saw her putting something in every seventh quart. Now, I knew they were poor, but I wonder why they didn't put it in every quart. So I said, hey, Pat, what are you doing? She said, Jerry, every seventh quart. I'm putting black pepper in there. That's for Sunday. <laughs> Woo! Marcel Ledbetter got an older sister. She met her one of them fellas at Camp Van Dorn in Centerville, Mississippi, when he was down there in the war, one of them servicemen. And she fell in love with that soldier. And he come back from the war, he moved her to Chicago. And she's lived in Chicago now for 50 years. Well, she come to see her, her old daddy the other day, Uncle Versa Ledbetter. And she got out of her vehicle and had a, one of them sausage dogs with her. <laughs> Looked like a dog stretcher had had a hold of it. Looked like a big long stalk of bologna with two legs at each end of the bologna. And they hadn't been down there but about two days, and that blooming sausage dog done killed one of Uncle Versus chickens. <laughs> Next day, he got after some kittens, and that dog was chasing them kittens toward the barn. And the old mama cat, great big country mama cat, walked out in the hallway of the barn and was watching that dog coming toward her, chasing her kittens. And Uncle Versus said, don't let the dog get close to the mama cat. And Uncle Versus' daughter said, Woo, you better catch him. Oh, Papa, you better catch that dog. He's killed every cat on Cobb Street in Chicago. About that time, that mama cat got a hold of that sucker. Uncle Versi said, honey, that ain't no Cobb Street cat. <laughs> Marcel Ledbetter is the dearest friend I have in the world. Marcel's got a brother, 
you down. What grows chickens? He's got in the hen house. And the other day, you Dell noticed that there's rat holes all under that hen house. You can just see them. Cages are up off the ground, but you can see look like moles down under that. Them big old wood rats. And you Dell couldn't put out poison because his chickens would eat. He couldn't trap them because he's afraid his chickens would step in the trap. So one day he poured gasoline down in them holes. Four gallons of gasoline. He got him a big long stick and he waited. Not the first rat run out of that. So he struck a match. <laughs> Throw down at the entrance of one of them holes. Boom! went all down through them tunnels. Boom! Explosion! Fire come up and shot up through the chickens and through the roof. <laughs> the ground was turned wrong side out. Chickens were swinged. Smoke was bellowing. Neighbors run. Said, you tell. What are you doing? I'm killing rats. <laughs> said, how many did you kill? He said, not a cotton-picking one. <laughs> I was over at Marcel Ledbetter's house one day, and we were sitting at the dining room table eating dinner, which is at 12 o'clock where we live. Some folks call it lunch, but we call it dinner, and the evening meal is supper. The phone rang, and Marcel Ledbetter's wife, Asley, went out in the hallway and answered the phone. She come back and sat down. Marcel said, who was that? I said, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? What went on? So well, I answered the phone, and this boy said, it's a long distance. From Washington, D.C., I told it sure is, and hung up the phone. <laughs> Not too long ago, a man brought a monkey by the country store at Route 4 Liberty, Mississippi, and the storekeeper bought the monkey. He was a pet, and that thing would pick a little banjo and make a racket. And he, he, he was a, he, he's a musician, that monkey was. Well, one day a chartered busload stopped by that, was coming to see the Jerry Clower Museum on Jerry Clower Highway at Route 4 Liberty, Mississippi. And they stopped by that country store to see that monkey. And that monkey was sitting up on top of the pickle barrel. And he was picking. And the uh, man looked and noticed that that monkey's tail was down in them pickles, just hanging down in the pickle barrel. And the man eased up out behind the storekeeper and said, Sir, does that monkey know he's got his tail in the pickle barrel? And the manager of the store said, I don't know, but if you hum a few bars, I bet you he can play it. <laughs> Woo! We had an old boy to call my bank the other day, six o'clock at evening. And the phone rang and it rang and it rang. And finally the janitor went over and answered. Hello, this boy said, what's the matter with you dumb, headed, dumb clucks down there? I ain't got no overdraft. I got money in that bank. You cotton pickers, how sorry can you be? 
to return one of my checks. This old janitor said, sir, just hush, wait a minute. When I said hello, I done told you all I know about this bag. <laughs> Woman in my county the other day got bit by a mad dog. Fine lady. Everybody loves her. And the doctor went and told her, said, we done run the test. The dog's rabbit. She said, hallelujah, I'm fixed to make me a list. What? I'm going to make me a list. Said, make you a list. Why? I said, of people I'm going to buy. <laughs> I growed up as a little boy thinking that my heart was in my rear end. I started to school and started studying anatomy and parts of the body and nomenclature of the human being. And I found out where my heart was. The reason I was so confused, every time I'd get around my grandma, she'd pat me on the fanny and say, God bless your little heart. Folks, I want you to help me do something. This is Armed Forces Day. But I want everybody in the world, when they hear this album, to know that I'm proud I fought for my country. I thank God we ain't in a shooting war. And I thank God for freedom. And if you don't love this country, you ought to visit other countries. But I know you Kentucky folks are patriotic. I done fought a war with some of you. I joined the Navy the next day after I finished high school. Me and Marcel Ledbetter caught that fast train. Went to Williamsburg, Virginia to boot camp. Then I ended up in radio school and on the USS Bennington CV-20 an aircraft carrier. I thank God as I stand here before you because I can remember 50 to 100 times when I saw a kamikaze airplane coming toward the Bennington loaded down with bombs. He wasn't dropping them. He was trained to give his life for his imperial country and he was going to crash that airplane into my aircraft carrier. They hated aircraft carriers so bad that every carrier the United States Navy owned was hit by a kamikaze attack with the exception of three. I have seen kamikaze after kamikaze head toward my ship. And with the help of battleships and cruisers and destroyers around us and seagoing Marines shooting automatic weapons at them, We've always been able to explode them just before they hit the Bennington. Oh, the reason I love this country so much is I know what it took to keep it free. And wherever I go, I salute the armed forces. I visit uh, armed force bases all over the country. And if I happen to be in a place and it's Armed Services Day, uh, I also recognize that. I know you folks would want to join me here, right now, not just salute the Navy, which I was part of, but let's hear it for all of the United States of America Armed Forces.